everyone to our DevSecOps panel discussion. For the next 20 minutes, uh, we'll be discussing launching a DevSecOps project uh, and to mature your program for large organizations. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our uh, panel. Uh, and we are honored to have Grace Law from Manulife, who traveled all the way from Toronto, Canada, uh, to discuss with us how to uh, roll out a large DevSecOps program at scale uh, in an organization. Grace, can you introduce yourself in a few words? So, yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Grace Law um, from Manulife. So um, I've been in the industry for around like 15 years already, starting from audit, um, risk and controls, all the way to AppSec. So before I, I was actually working in AXA, and then now I'm moving to Manulife in Canada. So um, can, um, for Manulife is actually the second largest insurer in the North America region. So we have like a couple thousands of developers. So um, developers is my customer. So my job is to make sure that they can actually deliver the application securely, but at the same time won't be blocked by all the necessity, like all the noise that actually happening. We also have uh, Shaban, who's senior solution engineer at Sneak. Shaban, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shaban. I work at Sneak. That I'll uh, introduce to you in uh, in the, a few minutes. Uh, I've been there for the past three years, uh, basically helping companies adopt the DevSecOps culture. So my role at Sneak is to um, raise awareness towards DevSecOps security, but also help developers and security teams implement DevSecOps with a tool like Sneak. Um, so you can also see me doing live hacking, um, panels like this, and any conversations around uh, DevSecOps and application security. We also have Eric Fourier, CEO of Git Guardian. Eric, welcome. Um, yeah, so I'm Eric. Hello, everybody. Uh, CEO and co-founder of Git Guardian. Obviously, I've been here since the start of the company. Uh, I'm an engineer, developer, and machine learning engineer by uh, background, and yeah, created Git Guardian uh, six years ago. And we'll talk a bit about what we do in the next uh, few minutes. And I'm Guillaume, also part of the Git Guardian team, and I will be moderator for today. So. Let's discuss how typical large organization launch, you know, uh, uh, AppSec or DevSecOps program. Usually there is a compelling event, you know, there is a reason to change, to invest man hours, you know, energy and focus on such a program. So Grace, you know, what, what is typically the compelling event to do such a program? Oh, sorry guys, went too quickly. Absolutely. Um, in a few words, Sneak? Yeah, so just to introduce yeah. Sneak for those who don't know about uh, Sneak. Uh, I've been a couple of fixes before, uh, just so, so that you understand a bit what Grace will tell you about and uh, what she's been dealing with on the Sneak side. So we're a developer security platform. Uh, what this means is that we help developers secure their applications, but also help sec security teams um, implement a DevSecOps process and govern um, their, their teams as well. So at Sneak, you can actually scan different things as part of your application. You'll see it's quite a broad platform, uh, but the idea is that as a developer, you can scan your entire application, your code, your dependencies, your container, and your infrastructure as code. Um, we were founded by developers, so really it is what's at the core of the platform. Um, feel free to try it uh, by going on the Sneak website. It's, we have more than 3 million developers uh, using the platform today. Uh, we were founded in 2015, um, and it's a very intuitive platform to just use um, and get started with. So uh, feel free to have a look at, and um, yeah, we'll talk more about uh, how it can be implemented at, at scale uh, in, the next, in the next minutes. Eric, in a few words, you want to present Git Guardian? Yeah, quick introduction on Git Guardian. So, also a code security company, really developer focused. So, we have 300,000 developers using the platform. Uh, we are focused on secret detection in both public and internal repos. So, what does it mean? Is like we find like AWS root credential, database credential leaked in source code, public, uh, are either publicly available or inside the different repositories. And uh, yeah, we have customers all around the world and uh, growing fast uh, in the US and also in Europe. 
So some of you might know, but last year we announced a strategic partnership with SNCC, essentially bringing technology integration, allowing customers to use two of the best of breed solutions in the market to cover all their AppSec risk with you know, SNCC taking the lead on everything SaaS, SCA, infrastructure as code scanning, and GitGaian delivering you know, great capabilities when it comes to sequence detection and potentially intrusion detection in the form of Honey tokens. So going back to my question, <laughs> Grace, why would a large company launch, you know, a DevSecOps program? Okay, so I think uh, for a lot of the um, large organizations, just like the two that I've been uh, working, is that um, we have different business units and then the people trying to develop their code in their own way. So different business units will have pretty much different kind of scanning tools that might or might not even develop on their own. Um, and then um, it is not on the pipeline, not automated. And when we are talking about Agile, it's not what for anymore. You cannot just scan it like um, just towards the end. And then we would think that, okay, as, a, as an organization, we need to start thinking about how to encourage the, deliver, uh, the delivery of secure code by the developers but at the same time, not stopping them like the gate um, in the last minute. So this is the reason uh, why I think a lot of the organizations start thinking about DevSecOps, incorporate security into the DevOps pipeline. Shaban, from talking with so many organizations and customers, do you have a take on this? Yeah, I mean, obviously every company wants to do security. Uh, so they is, there is a need to have a DevSecOps culture and program so that these vulnerabilities can be fixed as early as possible. Um, from my experience, there are, um, there are some companies that start from scratch. They have no tools and they want to start exploring um, implementing some tools in place, but very often um, there are already tools in place, uh, but they're not adopted. And this is what drives a proper DevSecOps program. Uh, and the two reasons why these, um, this is, these tools are not adopted is either one, it's a tool problem. Uh, the tool is too hard to integrate, too hard to use, it's too slow, false positives or remediation is hard. So either it's a, it is a tool problem that is uh, blocking the DevSecOps program to actually work or it's a culture uh, or people, a problem in the sense that there's no ownership of DevSecOps. Uh, it's more than a tool question. Uh, there are two factors in the equation. In equ equation. You also need um, to have some ownership of security, of um, awareness of the developers also to be involved. So, um, so it's, it's a bigger question as well. Eric, secret detection is a bit of a newer vulnerability. I mean, SAST and SCA are quite mature now, you know, for like six, ten years, people are starting to equip themselves. Why does a large organization start tackling the issue of secrets in your experience? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So I will say six years ago, we, we invented the space of uh, secret detection and it was really an early adopter market where a like, company had usually an incident due to a secret, a secret leaked on public GitHub and an attacker used it and did it a lot, did a lot of damage in the company. And uh, they are, were like at putting in place uh, some either DIY solution uh, based on open source to, to try to, to find secrets in the code base and also buying uh, Gitkain or a little bit more uh, early stage company at the time. Uh, but now the market has evolved a lot and yeah, secret detection becomes more of a standard compliance uh, checkpoint and a way to, to protect organization also. So uh, company have this do-it-yourself solution that usually have a lot of false positive and really focused on detection and not really remediation, meaning they will detect the secrets in the code base, but not uh, try to actually remove them out of the code and remove the vulnerability. And that's really like uh, where, where like companies are, are looking for a solution in really on the remediation side. So how can I fix the issue and not only know that I have problems. So let's project ourselves. Let's say we are a large organization. We have built consensus. You know, people are aware we have a problem. Our current tool set doesn't deliver. We don't have the right adoption. We don't see the right culture in place. So what's, what's the checklist of things we want to see, both from a tooling perspective and a culture perspective? Grace. OK, so for the tooling perspective, I think um, as an enterprise, well, 
you have a lot of vulnerabilities. But when you think about there's a lot of tools that um, yeah can identify a hundred vulnerabilities, but they're also giving us a thousand false positives. So which means in the end, no one will actually take it seriously for the report, and they will also. Uh, have a lot of pressure to the security teams to actually validate the vulnerabilities one by one. So for us, the most important thing would be, um, first of all, less false positives, focusing on things that is actually matter the most. And this is also related to the next point. So um, if the tools just give me a bunch of vulnerabilities, but for example, for the uh, recommendations uh, on how to actually fix it, no one can understand it. There is also a problem because people cannot fix it. So um, also on the other hand is it should be developers friendly because as I've said, if the developer do not even like the tools, they do not want to run the tools, it won't be able to actually um, integrate it into the current enterprise pipeline. So what's the point, right? Uh, people are just ignoring it, find a way to actually skip it. So. Um, this is actually related to tool, but also related to the culture that um, the, the companies need to actually change and educate the developers. Um, also, people are talking about shift left. Everyone um, used the tagline shift left. So um, as a company, we would love to see the um, problem identify as early as possible. So um, any ID plugins um, would be actually very beneficial because the developers would actually fix it on their own. And also the developers would be happier because, well, you don't need to wait for the uh, vulnerability being being scanned and put on the dashboard and everyone knows it. Um, we often talk to our developers and saying that, hey, if you're using the ID plugin, you can actually fix your own problem without letting your boss know. And they actually just love it. So yeah, I think this is actually a few few points that we're, we're looking into. Shaban, what do you have on your list of must-haves? Yeah, I think it's... Uh... If you try security tools, uh, it's very easy to find a tool that gives you a list of problems. Uh, they all do that. The question is, uh, what do you do with this list? And uh, this is where you can really see the added value of a, of a tool compared to another. So we do have a lot of focus on prioritization, for example, at Sneak. We have our own database that we fill with information so that if you do scan, you do know among the 100 vulnerabilities you have and the 25 criticals, what is the first one that you should fix? Uh, and what is the second one that you should fix if you have some more time? Uh, so prioritization is usually the key element uh, to start with, uh, to see if you can actually find a way to, to start working on your, on your backlog of vulnerabilities. But something that Grace said, and that's probably the most important, is how to remediate these issues. Um, if you have a great tool that is easy to integrate with great prioritization, but developers have no idea how to fix the problem, um, you're, you're lost and the tool is not going to be adopted. So the remediation part is very important and, um, and that ties the whole workflow of knowing what to fix and, and how to fix it. Uh, at the end of the day, what we like to do is just to have developers testing the tool uh, so that you can get their honest feedback and they will tell you that uh, what works and what doesn't work for them. And they can tell you it's actually very easy to import one project uh, and it's also very easy to import a hundred or a thousand, so they can see the whole picture into their workflow. And then it ties up to their integrations as well, IDs, pull requests, and so on. But it, it goes down to, um, to the key features of prioritization, remediation, and developer feedback so that they can actually see themselves using it on a daily basis. Thank you. Eric, anything to add, you know, specific to sequence detection that, you know, can be a bit different from your typical top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities? Yeah, maybe to, to add a little bit on, on that, we talked a lot about shift left and remediation. So especially for SQL, but even in code security in general, we really believe on the, the shared responsibility model. So if you look at the world today, you have the developers that need to master like so many technology, front end, back end infrastructure now. Also, we ask them to be security engineer and champion. And 
at the other part of the spectrum, you have uh, one security engineer for 100 developers. So it's really, you need to make them work together and with the security team that's responsible to actually orchestrate security policy, put give tools to developers that can be in their workflows, but that are not responsible for fixing the incident. At the end of the day, as a developer is writing the code, when you look at secret detection, it's actually a mistake like you, you do, like you just put the secrets in your code. When you look at vulnerabilities in dependency, you use a open source software component that has a vulnerability. So you need the security team giving tools and educate the developers and, and give them actually and not like uh, reduce the velocity of development. So that's a key challenge for me, uh, for, for us right now. So based on that really robust and well thought out list of requirements, we've now selected a tool. How do you start using it? You know, how do you launch an initiative, selecting a pilot team? Grace, you know, would you rather go with the really security minded, mature teams, or maybe start with the, you know, less equipped, full of vulnerabilities, app dev team, to try to bring the most impact? Actually, not this two case. <laughs> um, actually, it would be the most creative teams. The teams that would be able to work with us to give us honest feedback. Because um, sometimes it's not about whether the tools could identify vulnerabilities or not. Um, like a lot of the tools is very mature in the market. But the thing is, we don't know the nuances. When we do the implementation, whether the um, developer experience will be impacted. And this is actually based on the culture for the uh, organization also. So different organizations may have different needs. That's why there are so many tools um, in the market. There, there is a reason for that. So when we do the piloting, when we do the POC, we will actually choose the most uh, creative teams, um, the team that can actually work with us. And then afterwards, uh, when we start implementing that, we learn from the first team. So when we roll out to other business unit, um, we can just let them know, hey, we have already doing that in whatever business segments, and this is their feedback. And this will actually help the more like risk averse team to actually change. Um, at the same time, like, Awareness is super, super important. Communications is super, super important. Like, um, we need to actually change the mindset for the developers. Security is here to help. Security is not someone that actually stop you from deploying your um, application uh, in a release. We are not the bad guy. We are just here to actually help you. So we give them a lot of um, communications ahead of time awareness training, and then we also present ourselves as a team that can actually work with them. So this is also what we will be doing. But at the same time, we will also work with um, Second Life Defense. Um, they will actually set up different risk matrices um, and also standard to actually associate it with the tool that or capabilities that we are actually bringing along. Um, because sometimes, yes, we really want to encourage the uh, developers to actually use it, but at the same time, you need to have the standards. So if a team said, well, we do not uh, have the time or resources to do it on fixed vulnerabilities, then you need to actually use the standard. Actually, when you discuss with the second half defense, say, well, it's actually staying the standard, so you really need to actually think ahead. And um, we can help you to achieve it. We can prioritize that. We can actually have different checks in place in uh, within the pipeline such that you're not Grace getting the Grace, on that topic results. of prioritization, you know, like yeah. one of the things you always mention is how overwhelming it is to get the first yeah. scan results because you can yes. get thousands or tens of thousands yes. of incidents right away. So how do you guide team and how do you like, make them be confident that they're going to tackle the right stuff in the right order? Well, you, okay, so first of all, you really need to um, help them to prioritize. And um, this is actually very important. Um, but it's more than just the tool, it's also related to what is actually being scanned. Like, uh, let's be honest, in our repositories, we have a lot of things that might or might not actually be relevant. It might be historical, it might be testing file, it might be something that is not needed. 
So when you actually add those in the scanning and whatsoever, this actually complicated the whole result. So first of all, you need to clean your house and then do the prioritization and to let them fix um, the more critical vulnerability first. And at the same time, we need to set up things such as, okay, the dashboard, like, oh, um, this particular business segment has already uh, remediate 60% of, of the vulnerabilities or the, or the other one, 40. Then when you actually submit the report to the senior management. So you play on kind of like yeah. competitiveness. Okay. Yes. Sh Shaban, any take on that, you know, getting adoption, getting people confident to use the tool, what, what works in your experience? Yeah, I think it depends on the maturity of the company. Sometimes we have companies that are used to having security tools and developers uh, sometimes uh, really like uh, actually seeing that, oh, these tools is easier uh, to use, um, it's easier to fix. And then they get that satisfaction because they've had the pain of another tool. So sometimes it's actually better for us when we have a, another tool already in place so we can actually show the difference. Maybe the hardest part is when developers are not used to fixing issues or to deal with security tools and then we have to introduce them to something new. So there's some awareness uh, that can be done um, that can be driven inside of the company itself. Uh, you can have sometimes security champions that are driving programs, but uh, we also do like to raise awareness by doing, for example, live hackings where we have a session with developers and we show them, look at this application, I've imported one dependency uh, and this dependency has a vulnerability um, and because of that I can exploit it and we exploit it together and then they start to think, wait a second, I import 200 dependencies in my project, uh, is, is there any vulnerability in there? So, um, so that's, that's also something that can actually be very interesting to do. Uh, and the last part is the education. Um, there's actually huge benefit to having some educational platform to explain what in this, what is an SQL injection uh, or what is a um, cross-site scripting because sometimes you actually have no idea what, what it is. Eric, at Gitgarian, I mean, you have some pretty massive adoption numbers by developers. So how do you get them excited to use the tool or, you know, adopt new methods? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that we need to show impact really quickly. And that's where we, we really do at Gitgarian is like, even when you think about secrets, so we, we added a lot of features like, like validity checks, seeing if the secret is valid really to, to show to developers that actually you can, this is actually a true alert. So it's not a false positive and they can actually solve the incident. And I think it's where a lot of vendors in the security space have, have really give up, they just give, gave up on the remediation, just detecting a lot of stuff and not like tracking if actually the, the issue has been fixed. And that's really, I think, where we invest a lot in, that's always been our product philosophy, death over breast, meaning being really good and being honest with what is uh, our product North Star metric, which is just not detecting tons of secrets, but which like, can we help our customer fix them? So it's really helping our customers decrease the number of secrets. And when you extend to code security in general, to code vulnerabilities, and that should be the, the North Star metric from every code security vendor, which in my opinion is not the case right now. So great transition. You're talking about metrics, you know, KPIs. Uh, security is a data-driven sport. We need to show ROI, adoption, impact. So what are your typical KPIs, you know, in a DevSecOps program? Actually, a few also. Um, so first of all, uh, we, we talk about the coverage because um, if we implement a tool, only the coverage is 20%. So it's pretty much no use. So first of all, we are talking about the coverage. That is like super important. Um, and then the second of all, because um, we want to encourage the developers to actually fix the uh, vulnerability early. So we will also look for uh, the adoption for the ID plugins. This is actually specifically um, request by a lot of um, front line, like line one B folks within, um, within different companies that you need to actually encourage the developers to do the scans. Um, we would also talk about um, the coverage in terms of um, the tools that is actually implemented into the pipeline, 
because uh, again, if it is not automated, which means no one will actually do it um, in this real world. So this is also what we are looking for. And then lastly, we will be talking about um, the remediation of vulnerabilities over time. Um, we are not measuring specific um, vulnerability uh, for the time being, because when you think about different business unit, they might have different numbers of vulnerabilities. So I don't think it's actually fair to talk about, oh, you have 10 vulnerabilities, oh, you have 100 vulnerabilities. Um, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for, okay, if you have the one vulnerabilities, we encourage you to fix it. So how long for you to take to actually remediate um, the vulnerabilities? Shaban, anything else you think are you know, interesting to monitor over time? Uh, I think it depends on the business case of the of the company itself i think every company has its own first objectives um if if you come as a company and you've never really managed to scan all of your repos because the tool that you had was too slow or was too hard to implement or maybe it was priced in a way that was hard to just scan everything and maybe the first objective is i want to scan every repo uh, that I, I i have and that can be already something that is um is a challenge in itself. So if that's your objective, let's track that metric and let's show you how your coverage grows, as Grace was saying. Um, if you have thousands of vulnerabilities, but you want to just first stop new vulnerabilities from being introduced, uh, let's just track that number of new vulnerabilities every week or every month, and let's just see that this number is now reduced. Uh, so it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, a very common one is I have these critical projects, I want to see the critical vulnerabilities in this project. We give you the dashboard and you can see that number and work towards getting it uh, to a lower number and lower number. So uh, every company has, uh, has its uh, challenge, uh, at least first challenge. So that's the metric that you can track. And uh, yeah, there's uh, lots of uh, interesting metrics to extract from, from dashboards like this. Eric, as a former data scientist, you know, how do you measure the adoption of, you know, tools by your customers and what do you think are key things to monitor? Yeah, so about the, the coverage, I think for us uh, on the secret side, it's obvious that you need to cover all your repos because if you have, it allows only one secret to be, uh, one, if an attacker finds one secret, it can create a lot of damage, so you want 100% coverage. We, we talked about, of, for us, it's really a prerequisite that the coverage is 100% and the detection is good and we have no false positive. And for us, the real battle uh, begins after is like, how do we fix the issue? And we, we have this two-step process with our customers. We start with what we call stop the bleeding. So avoid like new secrets and new vulnerability entering your code base. And you can achieve that with, we talked about it, shift left, developer adoption, education. And that's like the first KPI uh, we try to, to optimize. It's like making sure no secrets and no vulnerability enter in the code base. And when we achieve that, we focus on the historical incident. So meaning like you are a large company, you can have 10,000, 20,000, sometimes 100,000 repositories with 10, 15 years of uh, code history in different languages, and you have tons of vulnerability, and that's where the real uh, challenge begins, is like how I'm gonna tackle historical incidents. And like here, like you have so many, uh, so many, you can leverage different stuff. It can be automated remediation through AI, it could be through shift left, could be using internal champions. So, and here, you have different companies that will use different strategy, but at the end of the day, the KPI is pretty straightforward. It's like your number of vulnerability should, number of historical vulnerability should decrease. So for us, it's a number of secrets in the code base. Uh, for SNCC, it's a number of vulnerability independency. For SaaS tools, it's a number of, I don't know, SQL injections, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the KPI is pretty straightforward, but companies, depending on their size, maturity, will have different strategy to make this metric decrease. So let's say, you know, after a year or two, all those tools have been well rolled out, well adopted, you know, the historical stock of vulnerabilities, you know, going down uh, in, a, in a linear fashion. What comes next? You know, what's the future of the application security industry and what trends are you looking at these days? 
Well, I think one of the biggest talk um, in the town right now will be application security posture management. Because now, yes, we have a lot of different scanners. We have a lot of uh, alerts, a lot of vulnerabilities. We're talking about um, criticality of that particular um, particular vulnerabilities, but we do not know in reality what would be the risk that is actually bring along to the company. So, and, and people will have the alert fatigue because you keep, for example, you keep on actually having the um, ticketing system. You keep on saying that, oh, you have um, critical vulnerability, but well, it's only our standalone ticketing systems and, and we focusing too much because there's a critical vulnerabilities that actually would make developers um, lost hope for what we are actually doing. And also when you think about we have more and more scanners and then if we actually introducing hard gating, which means if you have this kind of like medium or above vulnerabilities, you cannot go out for the release, they would have a very high chance to actually just block the whole release. So for application security posture management system, we can really take a look on the real risk based on um, different um, data that is actually gathered, not just for the application security data, but it is more like things like, oh, whether they're WAF included, oh, whether this is actually externally facing or internally facing. If we have all the information, we can actually make um, a better decision and we will not just keep on bombarding um, our development team with all the alerts. Thank you. Shaban, what trends are you seeing in the industry? Yeah, I think there are three things uh, that we can see um, coming up uh, more and more. First one is dev experience, even if it's already on the table. I think uh, it's now becoming at the core of a lot of companies, even old ones that were not really caring about the devs before. Now they became a dev centric company. So it's, it's very important and we'll keep seeing that. The second one is, is ASPM uh, to, that helps actually that helps you know if your security tools are working properly, if they're scanning how they should be scanning and just give you that confirmation. And the third one is Gen AI uh, because uh, that remediation um, can actually be now brought by Gen AI potentially. Uh, you might have seen some examples uh, already. Uh, if you come to booth uh, F10, I can show you some examples of Gen AI, um, but uh, definitely that can help the remediation and that's something to keep track of. Eric, when it comes to, you know, fixing the issue of secrets, you think Gen AI is the answer or do you see any other, you know, approach that could bring a lot of productivity and improvement? Yeah, for, for us on the secret detection side, uh, the, the remediation is a two-step process. Uh, first, like, you need to replace the secrets outcoded uh, by the correct way to use the secrets in uh, in an application which is uh, using environment variable, calling a secrets manager, encrypting secrets, so you have multiple flavor. And the second step is like once the uh, secret has been exposed uh, in the code base, you should consider it's compromise, so you should revoke it. So far, it's, when you think about it, it's two different persona. So the first one is a developer that needs to fix the code. And here, Gen AI can help a lot, uh, you know, it's stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it's really powerful at uh, because it will learn the language, it will learn everything and suggesting a fix works really well. Uh, for the second part, the revocation, it's a much harder process uh, to automate and we invested a lot in partnership with secrets manager so they can know when the secret is compromised and it creates a task so they can rotate and revoke the secrets. And actually, when you think about this remediation process, it's, it's really hard to do. And it's why we invest so much uh, in partnership and product capabilities to automate this remediation and, and make it actually possible. And I think it's my last take to the, uh, on my side is like, I think for me, the big change in the security world is going to be focusing on fixing the incident and not only just discovering issues and checking the box on compliance and people realizing that, yeah, they will be breached if they don't fix the incidents.